Well, that was a great uh, intro and segue into uh, my next talk, which will be... <laughs> oh, there it is. You guys have it. Yeah, you have it. All right, so PEA and pseudo-PEA. Uh, what's the difference and how are we going to tell um, these two entities apart? So I'm going to start off with a little story. Um, and this is, this is a real patient that we had um, in our emergency department. So this was a 57-year-old man who was at a baseball field not too far from our hospital, maybe half a mile away um, in the Pilsen uh, area of Chicago, and was watching his son play baseball. It was a Sunday afternoon, and he collapsed um, just along the fencing watching his son play baseball. Uh, bystanders saw the collapse, they checked for a pulse, they didn't palpate a pulse, and so they went ahead and initiated CPR. There was no AED available immediately at that particular baseball field. EMS was activated, and the EMS station is actually just a few blocks away, so it was sort of the, the perfect location for this to happen. Um, EMS arrived within minutes. Uh, the paramedics hooked up the patient to an AED. They found him in V-fib arrest. They went ahead and defibrillated and loaded him into the back of the ambulance and brought him to Cook County Hospital. When he arrived at County, he was in PEA arrest. We transferred him to the uh, gurney, the hospital gurney, and then resumed CPR and got the ultrasound machine to the bedside. And what did we find when we put the ultrasound machine on? So it's PEA because it's pulseless and there was some electrical activity on the monitor. However, when you take a look with the ultrasound, there's some activity here. And it looks like it's actually maybe organized, right? It's not fibrillation. There's something going on here. And so why was this patient who has, is generating some sort of cardiac output with this not producing a pulse? So in this particular scenario, how does ACLS guide us? What are we told to do when you see that there's some cardiac activity, there's cardiac motion, but not enough to generate a pulse, and you see electrical activity on your ECG. ACLS doesn't tell us much, unfortunately. So in this particular scenario, this is where we now have to get to a higher level of thinking and a higher level of critical care management. True PEA means there's no cardiac activity. So when you put the probe on, you're not going to see a whole heck of a lot. And so you can take a look at this particular echo. There isn't a lot going on there. This is to be contrasted with pseudo-PEA, which you should really think about as a shock state. So this is a patient who is generating minimal cardiac output and not enough to get a map and not enough to get a pulse. But when you put that probe on the patient, you are going to see cardiac activity. And so this is what we mean by pseudo-PEA. There isn't cardiac standstill here. There is organized activity. It's just not enough output to create a map or a pulse. Now, the focused echocardiographic evaluation in life support, or FEEL. I feel like emergency medicine and EMS is starting to make, we're transitioning towards like cardiology, all those like crazy studies, the ISIS trial, you know, now we've got FEEL. So focused echocardiography in uh, the evaluation of life support. This was a really cool study. It was a German study um, across four EMS system, urban, suburban, um, taking a look at patients who were in cardiac arrest. There was a, uh, the group of the, uh, the EMS providers, and then there was a physician that was thrown in the back of the ambulance as well and rode along purely to do echo. So all they were doing in the back of that ambulance was echo. And they found 51 patients. They had V-fib patients. They had PEA patients. They had all sorts of dysrhythmias. 51 patients were clinically diagnosed as being in PEA. Okay? And then they did the ultrasound in the back of the ambulance. And what did they find? Only 13 of those 51 were in true PEA. So 38 patients were in pseudo-PEA. They had cardiac activity on that echo. 
it changed management overall for all comers in 78% of cases, doing that echo in the back of that ambulance. If this does not disturb you, let me give you the number for asystole. Asystole, clinically diagnosed in 30% of the patients, a little over 30% of the patients, they had actual cardiac activity on that echo. That should blow your mind. <laughs> There's something really wrong here. 55% of the patients that were diagnosed as pseudo-PEA went on to survive to admission. And so think about your algorithm and how you manage PEA without echo, and this should scare you and prompt you to incorporate echo into your management. Now, what is the problem with echo at the bedside? And Scott kind of alluded to this, not kind of, but he, he alluded to this in his talk. The problem with echo is that it delays CPR. It creates this length, these lengthy pauses in the CPR that we provide. And we know that we want to minimize those pauses as much as possible, under 10 seconds, ideally. This was a study put out the University of Maryland um, looking at point of care ultrasound or echo specifically in patients who had cardiac arrest. And it was a relatively small study. They were able to videotape all of the arrests and then went and looked at specific times throughout the arrest. And what they found was that when you incorporated point of care ultrasound or echo in the cardiac arrest algorithm, it almost doubled the CPR pauses. And so this is not okay and really unacceptable. So how can we fix this? What can we do to mitigate this risk? So you're going to either initiate your CPR or if the patient is coming in by ambulance and they are already getting CPR, continue that CPR. At your next rhythm check is when you are going to incorporate ultrasound. And so when they pause, you are going to wheel the machine over and put the probe on. We have a lot of people at the bedside when we do our resuscitation, so I can always assign someone to be a counter. Otherwise, the person doing the CPR can be the counter. And so when they take their hands off the patient, they're going to count down. Six, five, four, three, two, one, back to doing CPR. And while we have that pause, while we're doing that rhythm check in that time is when you're going to do your echo. You're going to take a recording. We're not trying to make any decisions right in that moment. Take the recording, resume CPR, go back and review your images while CPR is going on. Now, the preferred view for me is a subxiphoid view. It's easy. I can get the probe on very quickly. I'm not going to be putting gel on the chest. So when my tech is going back to do CPR, they're not slipping and sliding all over the chest wall, I can get that sub view, wipe it off, and then we can resume CPR right away. If you want to do a parasternal, by all means, do the parasternal. CASA, <laughs> Cardiac Arrest Sonographic Assessment. Feel CASA. All right. So what does CASA tell us? What is CASA? So this is an algorithm that was uh, put out by our colleagues um, at Highland, and Ar Arun Nagdev was a part of um, this particular study. And essentially, there are three things we're looking for in the cardiac arrest patient. So on the first pass, what I'm looking for is tamponade, because that is the thing that I'm going to be able to intervene very quickly and potentially do a pericardiocentesis, and that could be life-saving for this patient. So that first pass on that first pause, the only thing I'm really looking for is tamponade. We resume CPR, the next pulse check, I'm putting the probe back on. This time, I'm looking for RV strain. And it's pretty important that you have someone who's pretty facile with ultrasound and comfortable and knows kind of the order of things that you're looking for. So now I'm looking for RV strain. That'll help me identify if there's a really big PE and maybe I should think about lytics in this patient. Resume CPR again, next rhythm check, I'm gonna actually assess the cardiac motion. Is this LV failure? Is there cardiac motion at this point or not? And so at each one of those rhythm checks, you're gonna be looking for tamponade, then RV strain, and then cardiac motion. Some people say just look for the tamponade and you're kind of done and move on. Um, but if you feel comfortable with ultrasound or you have someone at the bedside who's good with ultrasound, why not just go down the algorithm and look for all three? And so what is the bottom line with PEA and pseudo-PEA? 
Utilize ECHO and incorporate it in your management of these patients. Remember, we have a huge number of patients we're diagnosing as PEA that are not truly in PEA. And do what you can to minimize those CPR pauses and delays. We want to keep those in under 10 seconds. Thanks so much.